<laughs> thank you, Sangeek, uh, and thank you all for attending. Uh, I'm hoping that at, at the conclusion of, uh, of my presentation and, and that of uh, my colleagues that follow me, that, that you'll walk away with a sense of urgency about the uh, development of the technologies that surround broadcasting that are crucial to our future. If you don't know who Sinclair is, uh, we are the largest U.S. broadcaster. Uh, we cover 39% of the American population, uh, which is the cap that the FCC has placed on us. Uh, we operate 200 television stations, and we have been committed to, uh, to mobile television for over 20 years. I want you to look at this slide and, and really take this in. This was the uh, headline yesterday uh, in Bloomberg, Bloomberg uh, Technology News. Because in fact, uh, before we do anything, we have to understand why. Why are we doing what we're doing? And we're doing what we're doing in terms of advanced television, in terms of ATSC 3.0, in terms of convergence of broadcast and broadband because our survival is dependent upon it. Uh, people today clearly are spending more time in front of uh, their devices than they are the television set in the home. And if we are unable to address those devices across all platforms with all of our content, then we will fail as an industry uh, to be relevant in the future. ATSC 3 is a whole host of technologies, and uh, do not be afraid, I am not going to delve into all of these. Um, but we are, in fact, uh, positioning ATSC 3 as 5G broadcast. In the standard setting process, there were very important elements of the ATSC standard that were aligned with 4G and our 5G future. And these are just a few of the attributes that, uh, that give alignment between broadcast and broadband and wireless broadband. And these presentations will be available afterwards, so uh, I'm going to try to get through a number of slides here. As a broadcaster, I think I answered the why. We're looking for opportunities to leverage all of our assets to remain relevant. That is spectrum, that is content, and that is reach. And uh, just recently, uh, we concluded the, uh, uh, a uh, purchase of regional sports networks in the United States, which will make us the largest provider of sports content. Uh, and uh, in reality, the uh, regional sports networks will represent the largest part of our, uh, of, our, of our earnings. We have a build-out strategy, and the, the build-out strategy, I would say, is being led by Sinclair, but uh, is not exclusive to Sinclair. Uh, and this is a slide that was presented uh, about three weeks ago in Detroit at an automotive uh, event that was organized by ATSC uh, in the heart of, uh, of Detroit, of Auto City. Uh, and it states uh, there are today eight stations that are operating, operating on uh, temporary authority or experimental licenses. We announced uh, 40 U.S. markets that will be deployed and on air by 2020. Uh, and many of those are in process, and uh, we expect to have uh, probably 11 or so complete by the end of this year, 1919. Uh, there were 21 other top markets that, uh, that announced, uh, most notably the network owned and operated stations in top major markets. And in total, it means that by the end of 2020 in the United States, so almost 72% of the American population will be covered by ATSC3. I bring this slide up because this is literally for six years been sort of our focus of next-gen television. 
it is not just about television. It is, in fact, about all of the wireless opportunities that come along with a wireless IP standard. So to put into context ATSC3 and 5G, I'm going to look very, at the very specific parts of the 5G standard that call out the reasons that we, in fact, are integrating ATSC3 into the 5G environment. 5G is about radio access networks and their internetworking. And if you look at the uh, standard itself, the 5G system will support 3GPP access technologies, blah, 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 as well as non-3GPP access technologies. Interoperability, it goes on to state all of the reasons that broadcast falls into the classifications and embodiment of a complete 5G environment. Broadcast is a required element of 5G. That's not just Mark Aiken speaking. That, in fact, is inside of the 5G specification. 3GPP has made abundantly clear uh, and it has made, been made clear to them by the operators that broadcast is an essential element because of the efficiency. The one-to-many delivery methodology of broadcast fills a large place in the wireless future. And some of my colleagues will express that uh, more clearly, but when you look again at the 3GPP specification, We'll go all the way down to the end. A flexible multicast broadcast service will allow the 5G system to efficiently deliver such services. So you have spelled out the requirement for broadcast, and most importantly, the integration of non-3GPP standards into the 5G, 3GPP operating ecosystem. So 5G broadcast, as we think of it, is a multicast supplement to unicast. This is not an either or proposition. This is the convergence of two very different techniques of communication that, uh, that have very specific, in, uh, in, uh, cap specific capabilities, but in fact broadcast leverages uh, the ability to offload live content, real-time content, Unlimited number of users. There's no clogging of the pipe with broadcast. It is one to everyone. Uh, it provides, in fact, a better experience for the user. Uh, and I know in Korea that one of the major differentiations amongst the carriers has been an intense focus on the user experience. And uh, again, the purpose of this uh, symposium uh, and the work that I think all of us are engaged in is broadcast broadband convergence. 5G often is, uh, is, is looked at exclusively about spectrum. Uh, in some circles, we hear 28 gigahertz as is, uh, is a major focus, and it's an important uh, element of 5G, but it is not specific to spectrum. You have existing sub one gigahertz spectrum that's being used and will be refarmed for 5G purposes. It's already happening in the United States and other parts of the world. Uh, the the mid-band region, if you will, of, uh, of the uh, telco spectrum has higher bandwidth for broadband access and services. You have uh, a whole host of other sub-gigahertz spectrum that is being leveraged. Uh, two days ago, there was a demonstration of uh, 5G LTE and ATSE uh, working together, operating in the 3.5 gigahertz spectrum. And then we have millimeter wave, which has unbelievable amounts of capacity, but is limited in the, in the functionality uh, and will probably be focused on very small areas, uh, indoor services, uh, direct line of sight requirements of, uh, of millimeter waves. But what broadcasting brings to the equation is the UHF spectrum that has very unique qualities in terms of penetration, very unique qualities in terms of mobility. 
Uh, and if we can leverage the broadcast spectrum in conjunction with the other spectrums that are open to, to 5G implementation, then what we unleash, in fact, is the ability to converge broadcast and broadband services together. Uh, again, this is not about one or the other. This is how do we provide the internetworking across multiple platforms to provide to the end user the kind of experience uh, and to the providers the kinds of, of, uh, of services, valuable economic services to leverage all of the resources in the wireless community. Motivations for 5G uh, convergence, my boss would tell you it's all about the money. Uh, and it certainly is about the money, but it's about uh, uh, the relationship between, between money uh, and consumers and providing that consumer experience, both in terms of quality and in terms of substance, the nature of uh, the programming services, the data services, uh, the offloading services that can be provided add up to a very, uh, uh, a very valuable economic future for broadcasting. And you'll hear from, uh, uh, from my colleague uh, Parag a bit later about uh, the importance of, uh, of software-defined radio systems in the context of expanding the kinds of services that are available within this flexible ATSC3 standard. Leveraging the bootstrap, and I don't know, I don't remember the precise number, but we have the ability to address 14 plus million different combinations of, uh, of services, address them specifically uh, inside of that standard. Uh, hard, hard fought battle for flexibility to provide evolvability because we couldn't pack it all in at once. Uh, and we don't know what the future service requirements are. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, data sheets on the St. Kia chipset. So, ATSC layers above IP replaced to support mobile 5G convergence. What does that mean? That means that we've, if we focus on ATSC 3 at the bearer layer, at L1, L2, we have the ability to uniquely converge at the IP layer, whether it's at the device end or at the server end, uh, whether it's at that uh, cell phone level uh, application or in fact the core EPC or new radio core of a 5G future. Uh, convergence at IP is exceptionally important and release 16 is the right time to provide for that functionality and to, uh, to work as an industry to unlock all of the opportunities. How do we get there? Well, the typical architecture in television is based on this high tower and high power. In Korea, it's slightly different. Uh, high power, I believe, in Korea is represented by 25 kilowatts uh, ERP. In the United States, uh, we have the ability to radiate signals in the UHF band of 1 million watts. Uh, 1 million watts covers a large region, but just as uh, there are constraints in the wireless world that are defined by the edge, uh, the edge, in fact, whatever edge you define, whether that be the edge the FCC defines, or more importantly, the edge of the areas that you want to serve, you are stuck with a profile of serving that. And what that means is that for ubiquitous or nearly ubiquitous co mobile coverage, you have low capacity channels because of that constraint. We're moving towards SFN architectures in the United States. Uh, Korea is certainly well aware of the importance of SFNs, but that in fact provides medium capacity channel bit bandwidth uh, uh, by providing a, a sort of a layered density across the very large region, but in fact is still limited, particularly if your services are aimed at indoor uh, and, uh, and areas that, that have severe terrain blockage. And so 
we have what we, what we call a medium cell overlay, which is you have broadcast and then you have a, uh, an SFN overlay on top of that broadcast. Uh, but, uh, but by uniquely developing products such as a broadcast radio head, the equivalent of a, of a 5G radio head that is based on cell densification, you have the ability to overlay that SFN structure with a more dense structure. And that, in fact, then yields high capacity channel capability in the mobile environment. So there is a stepping stone approach that is being implemented in the United States. It's uh, being driven as well by, by the requirements of these kinds of services in other countries, such as India. And uh, I believe that the industry, our industry, is beginning to grasp the nature of the problems that we're trying to solve for. Uh, as I said uh, two days ago, uh, not my headline, a supplement to LTE and 5G, lifted right out of RCR wireless news, uh, looking at the integration of 5G, ATSE3, into the uh, automotive infotainment environment, where in fact uh, file delivery, uh, delivery of mapping services, and delivery of entertainment through ATSC3 become implemented together with 5G and brought to the consumer in the experience of the automobile. So convergence of broadcast and broadband uh, is, uh, is the road I believe that we're all on. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, this body for inviting me here today. And I hope that for uh, your colleagues who are not in, in attendance here today, that you can convey to them the importance of, of, uh, of this activity uh, and that in fact, a large part of this industry is engaged in solving these, these, uh, these problems. So I thank you very much.